Hampshire. Alabama. Alabama. Forchester. Forchester. North Carolina. West Virginia. West Virginia. Anyone from New York? Right on. I'm from New York too. Okay, well, welcome to Boston National Historical Park. Um, I'm going to be very brief because I know that you guys have another program. Um, have you had any other been here before? Okay. So I'm going to skirt over some of the revolutionary history since I know that you guys all know it already um, as teachers. You do, right? <laughs> Just um, So I'm going to focus mostly on the building and you know people who've been here. And then if you have any questions after, you can ask. And I know that you've heard the end of their other talks, so I'm going to leave that off as well. So I'm going to focus mostly on the earlier aspect. Is that OK? Great. Very cool. Well, on behalf of Boston National Historical Park, welcome to Daniel Hall. This building was built in 1742 by a man right over there. His name is Peter Faneuil. Faneuil was a French Huguenot descent. His parents came here to escape religious persecution. And he originally wanted to build a central marketplace on public property. Now, Boston used to be a very tiny peninsula. And so most people who lived in the town were in some sort of, you know, shop or business small town business store type thing. And having a central marketplace would be akin to a modern day Walmart. So just like a small town store versus Walmart debate that a lot of places have today, the citizens of Boston weren't too keen on the idea. But because he wanted to build it on public property, they had the right to turn down his request in town meeting. So they gathered in town meeting and they voted and decided to give him the ability to build this marketplace if they could have a permanent, neutral, and secular town meeting location on top. And so Fanny Hall was born. However, the original building was half the size and half the height. The wall was right over here to where I'm standing, instead of this way. Half the width, the ceiling is where the lights are, half the height. And so, we have about a thousand people standing remotely in here, but you can only be a certain kind of person, of course. What kind of person would be able to vote? Okay, property, man, white, what else? Member of the church, what church? Church. Protestant, yeah, you have to be some Protestant church member. One more, how old? Age? 25. Male, over 21, you had to own property, you had to be a Protestant, and you had to be free instead of white. So owning property in colonial Boston was um, not necessarily the same as owning land because there just wasn't enough land to own. So property could be a house, a business, tools, a horse, you get the idea. Being free meant that you weren't a slave nor an indentured servant. So there wasn't necessarily the race requirement here, but you basically had to be white because there are so few free African Americans in colonial Boston. There was for example, Prince Hall uh, lived over on Beacon Hill. He brought his freedom from his master. We just don't have the physical evidence that he voted here due to um, lack of public records from the time. But if you met these qualifications, you could come to town meeting. And the beautiful thing about this is that you didn't have to be a part of a certain class. You didn't have to be incredibly educated or incredibly wealthy. Once you got into town meeting, you had one vote, the same as everybody else. This is pretty unusual for the time. So it's something the Bostonians are willing to do anything to protect when the ability to protest is threatened. And that was in 1763, when the French and Indian War ended and Parliament started passing taxes to raise the revenue and thought it was owed from the French and Indian War. Because after all, they had just spent seven long years funding the war 3,000 miles away. It makes sense that they're running out of money. But now, the taxes that are being passed are taxes solely to raise revenue. So where is the money going? Paper. Back to England. As opposed to a portion of your taxes coming back into the community like you're supposed to, now all of the proceeds are going back to England. And after decades of voting on their taxes here in this room, this was personally offensive. They felt like the rug was being ripped out underneath them, and all the rights they had so really protected were now threatened. And that's why James Otis stood in town meeting in 1765 in response to the Stamp Act and said taxation without representation is tyranny. Why should we pay taxes to a government 3,000 miles away that will not let us participate and has passed this law and many others without our consent? And so people were like, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So they began to spread. Boston's committee, of course, 
something as liberal as the Sons of Liberty. But they also met in other locations unofficially to discuss things not related to government. And the Green Dragon Tavern, for example, is where they met as a plan to walk That wasn't done in the The uh, funeral for the Boston Master Victims held here, organized by Sam Adams. Sam Baxter Peel Celebration, organized by Paul Revere, also held in here. First, we said a bunch of the Boston Tea Party started here. The building itself has always been in use, though, and I don't want you to think that its importance only lies within the American Revolution. It was expanded to its current condition in 1806 by Charles Goldfinch, a very well known respected architect of the time, and he added this whole side, and then he raised the roof and added the balcony. The balcony is so that ordinary citizens can watch their elected, their representatives at work. So who's the balcony there for? Poor people who else? Women, African Americans, children, servers, and others. Through, and then when town meetings stopped being held here in 1822, because Boston was formally organized into a city, this place instead fell back into use for public gatherings, public meetings. And so the abolitionist movement has very deep roots here when Frederick Douglass was the first African American man to be here. But many, many rallies and protests have been were held here for the abolitionist movement. In fact, the town whether or not the abolitionists could use the building in the first place. And Jefferson Davis spoke here later, so it's not only for one side or the other. And that's also just as important. Many years later, Lucy Stone was the first woman to speak here, and I think you guys heard me talk about that when you walked in. So Lucy Stone was the first woman to speak here. Um, she was, you know, decades ahead of her time. So this building has always been very important in terms of firsts and people who would change the face of the nation through ideas. And so it's all about the spreading of ideas and how those who have spoken here came to fight for their own sense of liberty. And that's why it's called the Cradle of Liberty, as we said goodbye, James Otis. And you heard me say that naturalization ceremonies are held here twice a month. And, you know, I think that this is one of the best examples of living history that I could give you because everything in this building has a past. The chairs you sit in, thousands of people have sat in, and every painting has a story. Every bus has a story of the people who have spoken here. And it will continue being used and continue being in history, hopefully for decades and decades to come. Because that's the intent of this building, and it always has been, for public use, for the Cradle of Liberty. And so John <coughs> was right that we gather in the Cradle of Liberty indeed. Does anybody have any questions about this? Because I know that was very, very brief and much shorter than I usually get. Anybody have any questions about anything about the building, about the history? I'm scared question. Can you take over here for Washington? His horse is gone. Is the first thing That's a very common question, actually. Why is the horse that great? Um, the way I was told was to think of it like a snapshot. It's Gilbert Stewart painted it originally, and he is Washington observing the Battle of Dorchester Heights in the distance, and eventually he is going to swing back up on his horse and ride away. And that's the best that we can come up with. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? Yeah. I did have a question about contemporary history. Was this the location back in 94 where uh, Romney had his debate? Yep. With, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and like Terry Davis in session speech here. Yeah, the building's constantly in use, and I'm sure when they have like the mayoral debate and stuff in the fall. Yeah. Explain to me, I know this about that, the grasshopper. Uh, the most commonly seen story is that the grasshopper is the symbol of the London Royal Exchange, and why that's the symbol of over there is assumed because the guy who founded the London Royal Exchange really liked grasshoppers or it was on his family crest or something. But when, so when this building was built, it was essentially an extension of an English marketplace. And so that's how the symbol came over here. And also, they think that Samuel also just really liked grasshoppers. <laughs> sometimes you just, you have an affinity for grasshoppers. What can you do? Any other questions? Okay, and without further ado, I will turn it over to my coworkers to start 1812 Town Meeting. I hope you all ready. It's tons of fun. Be prepared to participate. <laughs>